can have students all over the globe who are able to collaborate and, and work together on a project. And it opens up opportunities and, and learning technologies suddenly found themselves in the real heart of universities having to make decisions about how to use technology. And welcome, everybody. This was a short preview of this evening's launch of the Future of Learning collaboration um, between ALT and ITN Productions. And I hope many of you can join us for this evening's conference gala at 5 p.m. Everybody is welcome, and the session is open to all and free to attend. But first up this morning, I'm just going to have a few housekeeping announcements before we jump in to what is going to be a most exciting session celebrating the launch of ALT's ethical framework for learning technology. We hope that you've enjoyed the first day of the conference and we are thrilled to welcome nearly 400 participants online in our virtual conference venue. My team is here to help you with anything that you might need help with, both on email, on Discord and on social media. So please do reach out if there's something we can do. Many people help make the conference happen, and I wanted to also add a big note of thanks to our headline sponsors, Canvas LMS by Instructure, and all of our other sponsors and partners. Yesterday and every day at the conference, you can join our headline sponsor and our strategic sponsor for lunchtime um, sessions. And I think there was a lot of fun to be had yesterday and also some goodies um, to be had if you pop along at lunchtime and join them in those spaces. A big thank you to everybody who supported our scholarship and as members of ALP helps us make our activities happen all throughout the year. Recordings from this and all other conference sessions are available via the interactive program and will remain available beyond the conference. We will make them openly accessible after the event in line with our commitment to the Open Education Pledge COVID. Now, without further ado, I'd like to ask you all to put your hands together to welcome the chairs of the working group that has led the development of our ethical framework launching today. So please post in the comments and post in the chat and say hello to our co-chairs, to Bella, to Natalie and to Sharon. Hello to all of you and welcome. Hi everybody, thanks Myron. I am your chair chair for today um, and I'll be uh, leading the session. My name's Bella Abrams, I'm the IT director from the University of Sheffield and I'm a trustee of ALT with my trusted comrades uh, Natalie and Sharon who um, can introduce themselves now. Natalie. I think you're on mute Natalie. I always do that. So I apologise. <laughs> Good morning, all. It's really great to be with you. Uh, yeah, Natalie Lafferty. I'm the head of uh, digital education at the University of Dundee, and like Bella, also an alt trustee. And Sharon. Thanks, Bella. Um, so my name is Sharon Flynn, and I am the project manager with the Irish Universities Association of the Enhancing Digital Teaching and Learning Project, um, and also a, a trustee at Alt. So I'm delighted to be here this morning. Thanks both. So um, today's session is going to have two parts to it. First of all, we're going to launch the framework for ethical learning technology. And then uh, later, we're going to open up a panel discussion uh, with some uh, excellent panel guests that we have waiting in the wings. Um, but without further ado, I think we'll start by introducing uh, the framework. And, and um, Natalie's going to give us a little bit of uh, background into what we've been doing over the last year or so. Natalie. Thank you, Bella. Yeah, so it's been an interesting year, really. I think the conversation about developing this ethical framework started at last year's summer summit, um, and it was certainly a priority, I think, for um, for all to see this develop o over the coming year. I think uh, this is really just the start of a journey, I think, but it's we've done a lot over the past year. So we brought together um, 
a working group um, of people who are in interested in developing and working on the framework and that met initially in November and then we we launched some initial thinking around the framework at the at the summer sorry at the winter conference at the winter conference um, and I think that really did launch um, that initial thinking and the initial thinking was very much built around the delicate checklist which we, we kind of used as a starting point and from there I think the discussion really did take off um, and we had further meetings of the working group, which we met at the, uh, tagged on to the end of the old assembly meetings. Um, and I think the, the critical point really came, I think, when Bella actually suggested that we look at some of the existing research ethics frameworks that we have in our institutions. And I think that really kind of pushed on the discussions. And from there, we drafted a set of guiding principles that could go alongside a checklist. Um, and then we, we, we drafted up those principles um, and then shared those, got further feedback. So there was very much a process of iteration. And then we launched a consultation with the community. So in March, sorry, in May and June, we launched a survey and we had over 165 responses to that survey. 75% of those were from old members, but we also had 12% of respondents from the commercial sector to and from vendors, which was great to see that engagement, but fantastic engagement and fantastic feedback not only on how the framework and, and the checklist and tool, tool sets might actually support us in our in, individual practice and be a guide to our practice, but also actually how it might inform uh, learning technology actually across our organisation. So some really good feedback that also um, indicated we should be maybe a little bit more robust in some of our language and maybe be a little bit less woolly, um, a bit more direct in some of the language. So um, we launched then a bit of um, a further update at the AGM back in June. And then it's fair to say there's been a, a mammoth task really over the summer uh, led by Marin and some other colleagues um, who you're going to hear from today, who have really sifted through all that, that really rich feedback. Um, and so we've drafted up um, a framework and um, there's been work done further on the sort of tool sets and things that, that go along with that. And then also projecting what's going to happen into the future. And that's really led us to today and um, this particular session. And um, so without further ado, um, I'd just like to thank everybody that's contributed, everyone that's come along to the assembly meetings, that's emailed us, that's had conversations with us, and to everybody that also contributed to that survey and gave us such really welcome and meaningful and helpful feedback, because that's really resulted in what we're able to share with you now. So I'm now gonna pass over to Bella uh, to basically reveal the, the framework. This is exciting. This is where I get to do a ta-da and some magic backstage. Uh, it should hopefully present you all with the new framework. Um, so you'll notice um, that we have it all on one page. Um, there obviously is a load of other stuff that kind of backs this up, but this is the framework for um, ethical learning technology. Um, and as you'll know, the, the kind of scope of exactly of, uh, as Natalie's just said, the, the scope of the, the work has been to articulate a framework that allows people to start making decisions when they're using technology and thinking about what they're going to do with their students. Um, and it, this isn't a set of rigid rules. It's not anything that you could um, absolutely specifically apply to specific technologies or contexts. It's to give you scaffolding around some of the decisions that you'll make. And the four areas of, uh, that, that um, we've kind of allocated things to are awareness, professionalism, caring community and the values of ALT as a professional body as well. And you'll see all of them on the screen. Um, and underneath all of it, which um, Sharon will talk about later, is um, uh, the purpose of the framework is to help three distinct groups the first is, is ourselves as practitioners to help make uh, decisions and think about uh, things that we're going to do with technology and uh, offer examples of how people have done this in the past. The second is for institutions uh, like my own and all of yours to have something that can um, help them understand uh, how policy and strategic decision making, particularly around the use of technology, which we all know is a very hot button issue at the moment, um, can be made um, from an ethical viewpoint as well as uh, from a strategic or a, um, a teaching and learning viewpoint as well. And finally, for industry, um, this is how we want to communicate with people that are making products that we want to use. So this is 
for commercial ed tech providers and companies to offer ways for them to demonstrate how they've taken ethics into account as they've been building their technology. And Natalie mentioned the delicate framework. So it builds on some of that, but it also allows uh, for other other things to be brought in uh, around um around choice of technology, use of data, and kind of that living in parallel with other, other things such as GDPR. Um, so now we've done our ta-da, um, and you're all probably, the, the uh, URL for um, the detailed work is, is in, in the chat. Uh, I'm gonna hand over to Sharon to talk about the next steps um, and what else we're going to be doing with the framework in future. Sharon. Thanks, Bella. So what's next? Well, we knew when we started this initiative that it would take longer than a year. And we knew that it was important enough to take some time over to make sure it was done properly. And as Natalie said, the response from the community has been so amazing. And, um, you know, this is something that people really care about. So we wanted to make sure that we do it justice. The framework that we've shared today is just the first step, but it is foundational. So today's launch event has been recorded and it will be available after the conference and some webinars and open sessions are being organized for later in September and into October. So do watch out for updates on those. The working group, which was formed to develop the framework, well, that's now complete, but there are still ways for you to be involved. Um, over the next year, um, the focus is gonna be on collecting examples of case studies and policies from individuals and institutions. So we are looking for example policies from other institutions and ideally those would be open licensed. Case studies of professional practice in various contexts, um, case studies from institutions, case studies from vendors and suppliers. We're looking for examples of policies for things like lecture capture, online assessment, blended learning and any other policies related to using digital technology for learning, teaching and assessment that address or have implications for ethical considerations. And these will form a baseline of policies and practice for the framework. A contribution page is already available on the ALT website, and we do hope that you will contribute. In the following year then, from 2022 to 23, the focus will be more on developing pathways to accreditation and expanding the framework by mapping it to other standards. Now, this doesn't mean it's not happening already. It's very likely that the framework will start popping up in CMALT portfolios, for example, and we'll be looking for good examples from accredited portfolios. There'll already be some synergies with other professional or ethical frameworks, and that's another area we hope you will con contribute to. So today's launch is not the end of a journey. It's not a finished product, but merely a first step. Again, um, to echo Natalie, we'd like to thank the working group and the many people who have contributed and been involved so far. Do take this framework, print it out, reflect on it, use it to prompt conversations with colleagues, with students, with vendors, with your IT folk, with management, make it a living framework. We're already looking forward to the conversations and how this work will develop over the next year. Thanks. Thanks, Sharon. Um, so at this point, I'm going to introduce the rest of our panel. Um, and they will start popping up next to me as I do this. So first of all, I'd like to welcome Kat Hallam, who is the Faculty Learning Technology Officer at the University of Kiel. I'd like to welcome Javiera Atenas, Senior Lecturer in Teaching and Learning Enhancement at the University of Suffolk. I'd like to welcome Rob Farrow, the Senior Research Fellow, a Senior Research Fellow at the Open University. And finally, John Traxler, Professor of Digital Learning at the Education Observatory at the University of uh, Wolverhampton. I nearly said Northampton then. Apologies, John. Um, so uh, welcome all of you. Um, we're going to talk um, today about ethics um, and how that um, works with you in, in your role and, and your, uh, informs your thinking. So I'm going to um, ask Kat first. Um, why, why do you find um, thinking about ethics in terms of your practice important? And, and how will the framework impact you, do you think? Um, thank you very much for today. I'm really delighted to be here. And also the launch of an ethical framework is something that I feel passionately about. I'll probably start with something unusual, something that I came to learn really a lot more about the, the importance of ethics. And it came from a personal experience, two personal experiences. The first one was around inclusion. And inclusion, I mean, um, from the form of disability. The second one that I was going to talk about is also how perhaps the world perceives me, 
that I, I don't actually, um, perhaps the way in which I walk around the world is also interesting about how people perceive me. So I'll go to the latter, the last about um, talking about how the world perceives me. So I've been contemplating whether to, to share this and I often do this with trepidation. I often feel quite vulnerable and uncomfortable talking about this. And I think that's part of being in learning technology that we re recognize how we feel extremely vulnerable. And in this instance, one of the things that I, the way I navigate around learning technology is quite different perhaps to a lot of people. And, and I hadn't, it hadn't occurred to me at first until a few years ago, I needed to go through extra steps. And by extra steps, I mean, looking for images that represent me. And um, I remember a while ago um, organizing an event and what I was actually looking for was pictures of a hand. So I looked around and, and I navigated around the web and I found very few hands that are actually, that represent my skin tone. So at that point I thought, oh my, okay, why not? Who would have thought a hand selfie comes out? So there you go, included in my material. Um, but then, then it, it made me really ponder, and it was the very early days when we were having discussions about um, diversity and inclusion in our own institution. And there are lots of things that I had to critically reflect on in terms of my own biases and the way in which I present um, information to a, a broad spectrum of people. And one of the things that I had mentioned was specifically, why is it important to me? Hmm, I've just seen a question come up. Why is it important to me? It's because right from the beginning, I don't often navigate around a lot of spaces that represent me. I had a, a, a tweet that went viral that had this very unexpected event that really meant that for us, we needed to consider. So why is it important? From a legislative perspective, so we, we, we need to, to think about legislation. From a personal experience, we all use learning technology from completely different experiences. From being um, inclusive, so it's important that we're inclusive. From equity, you know, there are lots of people who do not have the same technologies as we do. You know, we're talking about digital poverty. Then um, from my perspective, as I said, I, I needed to then think about my own biases. What are the things that, for me, when I bring to the table, how is my voice being represented? And also, am I keeping my experiences away from a lot of people, which I have been? So it's been really exciting. Um, one of the things that I talk about is it's really exciting to see in all, um, first of all, I'll just talk about the images. That is brilliant. I'm, I'm really delighted to see the images that we're having, which, which um, talks about what it is that for us, when we talk about ethics, the other thing as well that perhaps we might probably need to be able to consider is the range of students who come in from an international perspective. What are their backgrounds? How do we include them in the process? Are we speaking to them or are we um, observing them? Which I often find in academia, sometimes we are observing and right, but not necessarily actually engage in the process. So um, the second, uh, which I was going to refer to as well, was actually during 2020 was an unusual time for me. And it was an unusual time because very unfortunately I became unwell and that meant I had to be going part through the NHS system and having to wait. So, the, so when I came back to work as a phase return, as a learning technologist, I thought, right. So I was not expecting this. And so it, it, was, it was interesting having the foot. Is that the foot under the shoe? <laughs> I'm going to get confused. Um, to actually think, how would I use technology? How, what type of information do, do I presents to other people, what are the onboarding materials that we provide? How do we state very clearly our values? Um, how do we communicate to a wider community that there are certain things that um, break, break the laws of this land that we all understand, but then also the boundaries about sort of free speech. So it, it was coming from a place of vulnerability and, and I'm having to say with great delight, it's, it's good to be able to see this up and running. It's great to be able to see the values, the professional etiquette that we that would like to see. 
the care in the community and the awareness because awareness is something that is that is something that for me really stands out so i would say kudos to the team for all the hard work that has gone into this um i felt that the that the conference so far has really represented a lot in which i just wanted to see um in terms of learning tech and looking forward to that so thank you very much and looking forward to passing on to rob thanks kat um that was um uh, brilliant and i think you talk about so many things um, that kind of approach our, our own personal experience. But I think the really interesting point is having that opportunity to put yourself in other people's shoes as well is something that, again, when you have a framework around things, it allows you to do that perhaps in a more structured way. But thank you for sharing it. It, it was brilliant. So I'm going to hand to Rob now and ask the same question. So um, why are ethics important to you, Rob? Thank you. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, I think that ethics are essentially important to everyone, and um, we 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 get kind of um, brought up into an ethical set of circumstances. Uh, everyone starts off with an ethics, if you like. Um, for me, um, I went to university to study philosophy, and ended up spending quite a long time studying philosophy. And ethics was one of my main interests, partly coming from. Um, uh, the question of how do we justify any of this stuff with ethics? How do we kind of um, get a foundation for it other than just someone told you when you were young, this is what's right and wrong. Um, and so there's lots of different sources of, of values and um, kind of uh, ethical codes and that kind of thing. But I was always interested in what justifies it. Um, and philosophy is the place to go if you want to kind of engage with those questions. Um, and uh, after my PhD, I started working at the Open University, and um, I was quite new to ed tech then. And uh, I was working on different projects, and a lot of the time there'd be this sort of ethical component, an ethical side to it. But a lot of the time, the way that people in um, ed tech, um, which is a meeting place, you know, it's interdisciplinary, lots of different backgrounds come into ed tech. But not that many people with a philosophy background or an ethics background, or philosophical ethics. So the thing that I was always quite interested in um, was how do we kind of communicate the sort of valuable and interesting parts of philosophical ethics to people who are not specialists in that field? Um, so the work that I've uh, done uh, around ethics in mobile learning and open education is kind of informed by this starting point. How do we kind of... Um, find that sweet spot where everyone feels like they're being um, heard and listened to, but we're also taking a systematic approach and a kind of consistent approach. And we're, we're also taking it to a sort of meta level and reflecting on what does it mean to say that something's ethical, for instance? Uh, what does it mean to say this is right or this is more right than this other course of action, these kind of things. So you get into the sort of um, the meaning of moral language and uh, that's not always shared across different groups and different people. So in my work, what I've tried to do is bring some of the sort of the, the rigor and the systematicity of philosophical ethics, but to create tools and to create approaches that are accessible to people who are not necessarily specialists because philosophical ethics gets pretty complicated pretty quickly. Um, and um, in one sense, that's a strength. Um, that's a reason to do it. But it's also um, an obstacle for a lot of people because unless you're going to engage with, um, you know, primary texts and uh, do a lot of reading around philosophy and ethics, then it's a tough nut to crack, right? So um, I'm quite interested in kind of this this sort of um, this sweet spot where we get people, we get um, the right approach that lets us bring in lots of different stakeholder perspectives, and we get to have a kind of uh, equitable exchange, if you like, of opinions around ethics and find ways forward. Um, one of the things that I like about this framework is that it's not too prescriptive and it's not a checklist um, of stuff that you just go, yes, I did X, Y, Z, therefore I'm ethical. And this is something that you get in research. Sometimes um, I've done my research ethics approval, therefore whatever I do from now on is, is cool. I can just do what I like. Um, and just seeing, you know, reducing ethics to this moment in time where you go, yes, tick, 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 I've considered this X, Y, Z, I am now ethical. To me, this is not the right approach. Um, but you come back to this idea of how do we create the right 
tools and perspectives so that we're not just doing that, right? But we're still covering all of the right stuff. To me, the, the, the sort of trick of it is we need to get people to think and reflect in the right way and to sort of have the right categories of thought and that kind of thing. So, um, so that's the thing that I'm kind of interested in, in promoting, really. Um, in a way, it's sort of injecting some philosophy into what's going on. Um, but one thing that I've noticed as time's gone on, and one of the projects that I work on is the uh, Global OER Graduate Network, and we have a whole equity, diversity, and inclusion kind of strand. Um, and one thing that I've kind of taken from this work um, and from the EDI kind of interest more generally is that, if you like, I've come very much from a sort of Western tradition in philosophy. And there's the uh, temptation to just sort of apply everything through that lens. So one of the things that um, is kind of uh, kind of prominent in my thinking at the moment is to sort of just listen a bit more, I suppose, not try and jam everything into the categories of Western philosophy um, and give people that space to communicate their own sort of stakeholder perspective, if for want of a better word. Um, but without losing the kind of system systematic approach, without losing the sort of rigorous approach. So in my work at the moment, what I'm, I guess I'm trying to do is find another sweet spot, right, between those two things and kind of find the right categories and the right kind of language for that. So that's, you know, where I'm coming from. And I was pleased to be able to contribute some of that into the uh, ethical framework. Um, your uh, background in philosophy is causing um, some interesting stuff in the chat about whether Immanuel Kant would want captions in Blackboard Collaborate. And I think the consensus is that he would uh, and that we have a duty to do that. So um, uh, I'm enjoying that chat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks, Rod. That, that's brilliant. Yeah. And I, I think that's the that your approach is, is kind of similar to my interest in this, which is, you know, allowing ourselves to consider the justification for the decisions that we make that aren't just about wanting to use a piece of technology or an institutional objective or something like that and having that wider conversation. And, and I think that's why, um, you know, having this uh, framework to allow discussion amongst learning technologists, uh, uh, academics, and also, again, critically, uh, to, to offer a, um, a way for um, institutions to make those decisions and think about all of the consequences as well, potentially. So thanks. That's great. OK, so I'm going to hand over to, to John now. Um, and pose the same question. Uh, John, so tell us about what ethics mean to you. Right, okay, sure. This is a, um, probably quite a long story. Um, I, mean, I suppose one of the principal reasons um, that keeps cropping up backwards and forwards in my mind was that actually I had this kind of aspiration for Alt to be a, a professional body, quote unquote, to be grown up. Um, and it just seemed to be the norm, you know, that professional bodies, the ACM, the BCS, the BPS, you know, they have some kind of code of professional practice. And I just thought we needed one. You know, we need to be sitting at the same table. Um, but then maybe more akin to the kinds of things that Rob's talking about. I suppose I also thought it was important because of my professional history. Um, and part of that even back in 2002, was working on um, consortium projects. And I'm thinking of um, M Learning, where we were using mobile phones to um, assist the basic education of homeless people. And at that point, mobile phones were fairly fragile, expensive, unusual, and, and difficult. But as they became more of a social phenomenon and less of an educational one or an institutional one, it became apparent that there were, I don't know, informal ethics developing around how you use mobile phones. You know, what constitutes the right kind of thing to say, what is funny in the communities that grow up in cyberspace and what is not funny? Um, what are the right forms of language, interaction, hierarchy, and so on? And how if we were to do research in those kinds of areas, then we needed to know what constituted harm for those different communities of people out there. Um, you know, and, and how actually, whilst there's always this kind of preoccupation in university ethics procedures about kind of cutting up people and cutting up animals, you know, there were whole areas of other forms of harm, you know, embarrassment, oppression, um, that mobile phones were enlarging and redefining. So that that was one aspect of it, the, the need to keep up with evolving social practices. And then I also became involved in lots of 
work in the global south um, for example projects um, supporting emerging researchers um, and again it became very clear that different communities um, indigenous communities or nomadic communities we could reach and engage them with mobile phones but we had no idea what constituted harm upset embarrassment um, uh, you know how the different kind of power relationships worked out with them um, and so I was conscious that that also, as it were, enlarged or redefined what could constitute um, ethics. And so those two strands and, and the point at which they overlap, you know, the point at which every different indigenous community in the world practically might have access to mobile phones, um, just made it clear that outside the purely formal research defined context you know there was a lot that needed to be done and a lot that we needed to to think about um and i suppose it's almost a no-brainer you know why is ethic ethics a good thing well that's what a good thing is if you see what i mean it's kind of circular um ethics is about good things and ethics is a good thing um so that's probably a trifle simplistic for rob but i'll go with it um and, and i suppose also a kind of skepticism or criticality that we, I know as professionals, couldn't just assume that institutions or organisations or education or technology or research were just kind of unconditionally benign. You know, they were just okay. They were good. We weren't, you know, we were nice people. We wouldn't do things by accident. We wouldn't do things that were malign. You know, we ought to be forced to think about it because we couldn't just take it for, for granted. Um, and, and so that was the other strand of my, my enthusiasm for this work. Um, I think, coincidentally, as a, as a closing remark, um, yeah, I mean, as, as far as Alt is concerned, I think this is a continuing process and a great one. Um, but for me, it also is as well. I, I've been approached from several different angles to think about decolonizing the curriculum. Um, and I'm sure that must have uh, ethical overtones or ethical dimensions. But it, all of a sudden, it made me beg the question, well, what about decolonizing learning technology? So uh, you can you can put that on the bottom of the list uh, and I'll, I'll stop there. And thanks very much for the opportunity to work with all of this. Thanks, John. That's a really interesting point, decolonising educational technology. I think um, as a conversation, it's definitely one to be had. I'm going to hand to Javier now and ask her the same question. What does ethics mean to you? Uh, thanks, Bella, and thanks, colleague. It's it's quite a lot of food for thought in here. Um, my, my background is basically working with data and critical data literacy. So I've uh, been doing kind of this exercise at, at, at research and at practical levels, so working with academics in developing data literacies for, for quite a while. And, and one of the things that we've been perceiving in, in lately is, is the ethics needs to stop being an, a tick box exercise and something that, that Rob already mentioned, uh, needs to be a method of, and a praxis itself. So we need to stop doing things just because it takes the box in within a context, for example, of, of, of their ethics committee in the university. We need to embed the, the concepts and the principles and the overarching principles of, of, of um, ethics within, within our praxis. In, in the context of, of learning technologies and, and how Learning technologies basically work around data and datification of education, and is something that I bring back from from Sonia's um, um, uh, keynote yesterday. Whatever we do with technology counts as data entry points. The problem is that the entry points is basically us. So, bringing a bit together what what Freire and 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 Johnson said about becoming a, a, a subject or an, an, an object instead of a subject in within the criticality of, of being datafied or studied. If we don't have an ethical approach to how we use technology, our students will become, in ourselves, because we will be uh, measured anyways, um, we will become basically data points and objects of study. And, if we look from the perspective of, 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 of the data feminism principles, for example, what Catherine Dignacio and, and Klein do, it's, we need to challenge the power structure. So if uh, the learning technology used for education in, in, in general terms 
renders people as an entry as an entry point um renders, renders people as, as a data subject without agency without uh being able to challenge what the data is being said about them because of course when, when we gather data and mostly we're going through course algorithmic uses of data with prediction we can see that it's racist and sexist uh, at least that's on the bottom uh, and, and and the uses can be quite pervasive so one of the things that I, my, my interest, my personal interest with, with data is go beyond the do no harm principle. And we do no harm is, is just the, let's say the basis of it. We need to look above that. And um, first is have including elements of, of, of agency and, and privacy beyond what the law requests, because one of the things is like the law request to keep the data private. But then this same data can be used, for example, in a few years time from data that was gathered, for example, let's say a kindergarten level or nursery level can be used in 20 years time to predict uh, if the person is worth of a credit or a mortgage, because we don't know what's going to happen with, with the future of the data. And, 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 and this is um, one of the things that we need to be um, quite careful when, when, when we look into having a data framework needs to become a bit sometimes more of a deontological code of practice. Um, how do we exercise ethically when we interact with any sort of technology and how we understand and how we analyze the data that comes uh, out of, for example, performance metrics. Um, if, if, if we look at the language, for example, that we use when we talk about the data related to learning technologies and, and, and learning platforms. Catherine Ignacio points out that most of the language that we use around this issue has to do with the mining and extracting industry. So we exploit the data, we mine it, we dig the data out. We need to basically think about how our language affects some communities. I don't need to uh, exploit the data from my students. I want the students to be participants in the analysis that I do, because they need to have the space for challenge the, the data. Um, uh, challenging power, uh, power structures, why the data, or why the bias in, in algorithmic make people of color and people from, from minorities be subject to uh, more oppression than, than what to white people. So it's, it's an exercise of, communicating with the communities um, the same with consent collecting consent needs to go beyond ticket ticket boxes it needs to be a conversation it needs to be a co-creation because the uses that we do with technology can lead into knowledge co-creation rather than us get an insight from data and and and, and that's it so i think that that's from me that's my perspective that's brilliant thank you very much okay so we've um We've got some questions uh, from uh, our conference participants, which I'm going to throw open to the whole panel, including Nat Natalie, Sharon, Kat, John, Robert and Javiera. Um, the first question uh, is, um, how do we make sure our ethics framework integrates with those of IT? I can speak about that. Uh, research, teaching and libraries, uh, for example. Um, obviously, we're talking about case studies, um, but Peter's asking us, how, how can we, um, as uh, education technology professionals, kind of make sure that that all integrates together? I know I've got some thoughts on that, but I don't know if anyone else wants to comment. Stick your hand up. I'm going to fling it to Natalie. Oh, hang on one sec, John. I'll ask Natalie first and then I'll come to you. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think um, we had, um, I was part of a, a learning anal analytics cluster group as part of the last enhancement theme in Scotland. And it was interesting to hear of one university who'd actually almost it developed an educational ethics policy, simply because of the move to kind of blended learning and more online approaches. So I think actually, there's a real opportunity for those of us in learning technology, given that I think we're at the intersection, aren't we? of so many things and we do bring people together in our communities together so actually I think we're in a very privileged position of being able to start those conversations and I think this is where the framework is really helpful because we can begin to sort of pose those questions and bring people around the table and I think so often uh, universities do operate in silos and the kind of 360 degree view and sort of crystallization of every kind of perspective doesn't really happen 
So I think this is where we've got an opportunity and maybe some then some case studies can come out of that, which then others can take to sort of see these are the kind of levers that you can pull. These are the conversations you can start. These are the questions you can start asking to get that conversation going. Brilliant. Thanks, Natalie. John. I think there are at least two different angles. I, I mean, I'm struck by the fact that uh, certainly at my university, there isn't an overarching ethics framework or position or perspective, you know, and I look in different places and I see there is something about not about procurement. There is something about not working with terrorist groups. Um, and there is, of course, research ethics, but there is nothing overarching beyond um, the kind of a vision statement for the institution as a whole which might talk about opportunity or it might talk about excellence but that doesn't really get you very much further um so maybe this is this is asking about whether we need to think about something that arches over all of any given institution um but on the other hand it makes me think of work i've done sorry as a consultant quite a lot of the time and in consortia where you find exactly this problem that either there are different for example universities coming together and they've all got different procedures which i suppose is fine but cumbersome but possibly different principles as well which is not so fine and, and is and is problematic um but then actually as soon as you start working with government ministries or overseas governments or consultants or private contractors you find that th there's no ethics procedures at all um and so maybe that's a uh, that's a bigger question you know rather than kind of finessing finessing our little um, domain um, there is actually vast areas out there that need kind of crude attention before we move on to kind of finessing our, our part of a much more advanced relatively advanced area of thinking around this but I don't know what the answer is. Uh, it's a good point it's nice to be thought of as relatively advanced but I think it's probably right. Um, Kat, I'm going to ask you the next question um, because of uh, your, the role that you have. If you were going to use the framework within a, um, a, a tell team, could, would you have you any thoughts about how you might where you might start with that? You're on mute. <laughs> Thank you. Um... So that's a really good question to ask. How would we look at this in Intel? And particularly, um, I've been reflecting on the advancement of how the, a lot of people would ask, what's Tel? What's, what's a learning tech? How can you help me? Um, I guess it's what's in it for me. How, you know, technology sounds great, but let's put it into practice. And obviously, um, as a result of 2020, um, the pandemic that has really thrust us into the spotlight, and that has been the theme from um, the main uh, conference today, talking about shared perspectives. Um, the shared perspective of different, I, I can't remember the exact word. But anyway, the, the, going back to specifically, how would I wish to be able to have this done? It would be through uh, co-creation and co-design, and this is what it is that Javier has mentioned before, and having to, to look at the composition of who do we speak to? Um, within that composition of the team, I would wish to be able to have um, just going through the framework bit by bit and um, unpacking what do we understand about our awareness and looking at that section about, you know, in, in terms of professionalism, what are either a code of conduct or a method in which we can be able to liaise with not just only in terms of the academic world, but also suppliers, contractors, and you know, essentially what it is that we are presenting to the rest of the world. Um, the UK is um, known as the bastion of knowledge and a lot of families are incredibly proud to send their children from international communities to come here. So part of it is how then do we engage in a manner that, um, as has been mentioned before, is not just a tick box exercise and also um, critiquing you know, critiquing what certain aspects that we'd like to be able to, to see in this and come up with new values um, or a set of values and a set of principles that we wish to be able to work in. So for me, it would be making it far more inclusive, trying to think about who is sitting at the table, that power imbalance, how would I, um, for example, be perceived as an educator? Um, how would I be perceived if it was a student coming in as a stakeholder of the process? So I'd approach it as a step-by-step. Step. And also one of the things that I really love that have been mentioned here is actually getting case studies. 
there are lots of things that that comes through just through the form of writing that doesn't that that gives time for people to reflect on this so i would wish for that to be brought more forward and um we can find a way in which we can build on the research community as well and and uh, thanks for that because i think that's another trail for the framework is just a structure the case studies is how it actually works in practice and i think that's where you get the real kind of thinking about like Javier said, going beyond doing no harm because it's a tick box around data or thinking like that, but that case studies bring to life what harm can happen. Uh, speaking of Javier, I'm going to ask you a question now. So um, how, how do you think we can promote the framework to vendors and investors and engage them with it? Well, in, in, in a way or another, it's, it's about your procurement systems. If if the framework is part of your policy ecosystem without your institution, when you uh, open a, a, a call for vendors, in your procurement uh, request, you need to have elements of data collection, uh, where the server is going to be stored, how, how the data is going to be used, who's going to be able to analyze the data. So th this is for wh where the companies see that in the UK market, let's say, or hopefully, beyond the European market at some point, say, so, okay, if we want to sell this tool to the universities, we need to comply with, as, as academics need to comply with a baseline for teaching and learning. Um, the vendors will have to comply with certain elements in, in ethical uh, uh, kind of this development of, of their tools. Um, th there is an issue now, and we'll know it with, for example, the, the use of Google Classroom that uh, made loads of our agreements beyond <laughs> public purchasing, uh, and public procurement at school level um, internationally during, during the pandemic, uh, because there, was a, there wasn't a protection mechanism for platform or a platform governance mechanism for how ed tech companies can get into the educational market. Um, we can see the impact and, 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 and how badly the companies were um, actually working with, with the students' data during the pandemic and how much data they literally extracted and mined out of the use of the students. So now it's time that the universities have within their policy ecosystem an, an ethical approach to um, how you get your ed tech in general, as some or, um, institutions can have like a fair trade policy for the food that gets into the institution, we're asking something very similar for when we purchase technology. Thanks, Harry. I'm just going to bring Robin on this as well. Uh, thanks. Um, so my comment is really about, um, it also relates to the, the question before, uh, which is essentially how do you use a framework like this? And I think the simplest way to start with it is for each line under you know the different categories, just think about what actions you would take to achieve that end, right? Because essentially these are principles, uh, for want of a better word, we can get into the technicalities another time. Um, but it needs to be action guiding. It needs to make a difference to practice. So um, if you're going to respect the autonomy of different stakeholders or whatever, what does that actually mean for you in your role? And I think you can apply this to your learners, your vendors, you know, managers, whoever. Um, and to me, this is the sort of flexibility of a framework like this. It requires you to do a bit of work, right, to use it. Um, but then you can then say, look, these are the things we did to try and achieve this. And it's not just a check checklist because um, it's different for everyone who does it because of your role and your perspective and your kind of stakeholder group and that kind of thing. Um, and I think that's the way to sort of get started with something like this. It's about reflecting on the underlying principles, the underlying goals, and then thinking about the actions you as an individual or as a, as a group can take towards that. So that's my suggestion. Thanks, Rob. And it's perfectly timed to bring us to one minute before we're due to end. So um, that behooves me to thank everybody on the panel.
John, Rob, Javiera, Kat, um, my wonderful co-chairs, Natalie and Sharon, and to um, just say thank you to everyone um, in Alt and the community that has worked on the framework and has started to submit other info, case studies, other things. The other final thank you is um, in my kind of eye-watering multitasking here, I've been looking into the chat and the the um the conversation in the chat is is as valuable as the conversation that we've had as a panel i'm going to quote don pates here saying quality audience questions here as much of the perspectives from the stage and that's a really good way uh, for me to thank you all for the participation that you've done today so thank you very much everybody um it's been really great to launch it I, uh, the tada moment was fab i've been seeing stuff on twitter as well which is great thank you brilliant panel and have a wonderful rest of the conference day today see you soon Bye.